Nava Elimelech was the younger daughter of Makluf and Mazal Elimelech. She left her parents' house in Bat Yam on March 20, 1982, to visit a friend's home, which was about 300 meters away. She left behind a note to her parents, which had the following message. To mom and dad and the whole family, I'm going to Tali. Don't worry, I'll be back home. I love you very much. Her 19-year-old sister was the last person to see her alive. Nava Elimelech was born on March 20, 1970, in Bat Yam, Israel, as the youngest child to Makluf and Mazal Elimelech. They already had three older children. Josie was the eldest, followed by Jacob. Ephrat was the oldest girl, and when Narva was born, she became the darling of her siblings. Makluf and Mazal were distant relatives. Mazal was sent to Israel at the age of 14 after the abduction of two family members by Arabs. To immigrate without her parents, she added four years to her age. Makluf's mother and sister brought her along with them. The love between Makluf and Mazal emerged very soon. After marrying, they lived under challenging conditions in Jerusalem, experiencing days without work, bread, or vegetables. The couple reminisced about their hardships but highlighted the prevailing fraternity, neighborly love, and mutual assistance during those times. Josie and Jacob were born in Jerusalem while the father worked at a factory named American Shoe Factory. The factory's closure led him to move to Bat Yam, limiting his family visits to weekends. Eventually, the family joined him, settling in Bat Yam, and after some time, Ephrat and Nava were born. Like her siblings, Nava also attended the school in the same street where they lived. She was in the third grade when she met one of her favorite teachers, a sports teacher and assistant principal. He described Nava's bright, joyful eyes and her aptitude in sports, particularly volleyball, and encouraged her to consider a sports career as she seriously enjoyed every physical activity. Nava consistently excelled academically and socially in school. She was well regarded by her peers and teachers who described her as responsible, diligent, and excelling not just in sports but also in theoretical subjects. Another teacher called her a brilliant girl who was meticulous in writing and who decorated her notebooks beautifully. Nava was well behaved, informed her parents about her activities, and despite being at an age for mischief, was not adventurous. Nava and her siblings hailed from a loving and supportive family and reciprocated this support and trust by striving to be above average students, endearing themselves to all their teachers. In the summer of 1981, Nava and her family spent time at a hotel in Eilat, where the then-Israeli Prime Minister also arrived as part of his bustling 1981 electoral campaign. Nava's charismatic presence caught his attention, and he requested a photograph with her. Being the youngest in the family, her siblings were extremely caring and affectionate towards her. Her relatives described her as a joyful individual whose presence was strongly felt both within and outside the family home. On March 20, 1982, a sunny Saturday, Nava's interaction with her parents was perfectly normal. Breaking his routine, Jacob, her older brother who was already married unlike every Shabbat, chose to stay with his wife instead of visiting his parents. By noon, the married couple retired to their bedroom. Nava went out. She left behind a note for her parents which had the following message. To mom and dad and the whole family, I'm going to Tali. Don't worry, I'll be back home. I love you very much. Nava. Nava was deeply rooted in her Jewish traditions and family. 
eagerly awaited her bat mitzvah, significant for her spiritual and communal responsibilities in Judaism, but she had to wait as she was only 11 years and three months old. That Saturday, dressed in red trousers and a matching shirt, Nava was seen by her sister, Ephrat, who was across the street with friends. Shortly afterward, Ephrat thought she heard Nava calling out but saw nothing when she turned around. Upon reaching home, Ephrat informed her mother that Nava was meeting Tali. However, concern rose when Tali called, stating Nava hadn't arrived. Alarmed, the parents immediately reported Nava's disappearance to the police, who initiated investigations that night. In the subsequent days, the police and volunteers extensively searched the region, distributing Nava's photographs, using dogs to trace a scent in nearby dunes, and interrogating neighbors. Ten days post-disappearance, unsettling developments emerged. Some reports claimed a bag containing part of a leg from a young body was found on a beach in northern Tel Aviv and was quickly identified as Nava's. Further body parts surfaced on the shores in the following days, riveting the nation with the gruesome details of the case. Contrary to other versions, it was indicated that 10 days after her disappearance, some individuals discovered Nava's head wrapped in plastic, with other plastic-wrapped body parts found on Tel Baruch Beach. It's indisputable that upon submitting the remains for forensic examination, a pathologist who meticulously analyzed the body parts concluded that Nava had been murdered on the day she went missing. The Central Police Unit of Tel Aviv took charge of the investigation, but not a single clue was uncovered. Lifeguards, boat owners, and regular beach visitors were questioned, yet none had seen a man carrying suspicious bags in the area. Following the murder, the police assembled a team of 40 investigators and detectives who labored on the case for several months, marking it as one of the most extensive operations in the history of Israeli police. The investigation was challenging due to the absence of weapons or evidence at the crime scene. The team interviewed scores of people at various levels and even dispatched some of the severed body parts to a London lab to deduce a likely murder weapon, but all efforts to resolve the case were unsuccessful. Initially, it was speculated that Nava's murder was a revenge act against her family, as inferred by the remarks of the head of the Bat Yam police station. He noted that the method of dismembering the body and discarding it into the sea seemed intentional. The country was in turmoil. People withdrew from public affection. Streets were devoid of children. And Nava's murder, occurring on a serene Saturday noon, shook the nation's peace and revealed a vulnerability. The moment of body identification by Nava's mother was recalled as particularly harrowing. Under intense pressure, the mother was allowed to identify the body, which was prepared in such a way that only the head was visible. The whole identification scene left everyone present in shock. Following the identification, Nava's family organized the funeral. Hundreds from the region came to pay their respects. Investigators held that the killer couldn't have acted alone due to the mutilation and the moving of the body without being discovered. The commander of the Tel Aviv Police District stated that the investigation team was one of the largest ever assembled, involving various specialists. Intense efforts yielded no results, leading to public distress and imposed curfews for children. In 1982, the police focused on sexual offenders, but every lead seemed to be a dead end. Police cadaver dogs, which had smelled clothes Elimelech had worn, led investigators to the home of David Levy, a Bat Yam resident who lived close to the home of the Elimelech family and who had at one time worked with Elimelech's father. In his home, authorities found pictures of Elimelech and her friends. A police search was conducted, but no evidence was found connecting him to the murder. However, Levy was discovered to have taken nude photos of female students at Gordon Elementary School. He was subsequently convicted of pedophilia and jailed. 
An Arab resident from Gaza was also detained but released due to lack of evidence. Despite various theories, including that of a nationalist terrorist organization's involvement, doubts remained and after many leads, arrests and releases, the case went cold. In 1998, police arrested brothers Yehuda and Amos Shelef as suspects in the killing after Yehuda's ex-wife claimed he had confessed to committing the murder to her. Yehuda's home was searched and his yard was excavated but no evidence was found. The brothers were ultimately released due to lack of evidence. Nava's mother, Mazal, expressed her continual hope for justice, feeling Nava's presence despite the years past. Criminologist Avi Davidovich theorized that Nava was likely a victim of a serial killer, citing other similar disappearances between 1974 and 1994. He believed it was likely that all the murders were committed by the same individual. He maintained that the police would have had a better chance if they had made the connection with the other incidents at the time. However, he also said that they shouldn't be blamed because the police back then didn't have the level of experience that today's police have. On December 31st, 2001, Yitzhak Gatnio, one of the original investigating officers, was interviewed on the Galatz News Channel. Following some comments about the murder, he disclosed that the Israeli security agency did find evidence supporting the theory that the operation had been executed by a nationalist terrorist organization. The information came from an imprisoned Arab criminal who collaborated with the agency, asserting that one of his cellmates confessed to killing the 11-year-old girl. This man, a terrorist collaborator, had already been released from jail and fled to Jordan. Investigators disclosed that tests confirmed that this man, a terrorist collaborator, was indeed in the neighborhood when Nava disappeared. He wasn't investigated at that time, and as far as Yitzhak knew, the man had died in Jordan. In September 2010, the police commissioner received a letter reminding him that the 1982 murder of Nava remained unsolved. In the letter, it was highlighted the enduring pain of the Elimelech family, and their sorrow was compounded by knowing that the heinous murder had not been resolved by Israeli police. She asked the commissioner to inform the Elimelech family about which unit was handling the murder case and requested that the investigative team communicate with her as the family representative to update them on any progress in the murder investigation. The first police response was received two days later, confirming receipt of the request and promising prompt action due to the importance of the matter. However, time kept passing, and in 2012, 30 years after Nava's murder, the family was still in immense pain and all who knew the girl wondered if they had done enough. Remorse consumed a neighbor who hadn't opened the door when Nava rang the intercom, compounded by the family's questioning. Nava's brothers hadn't lost hope of finding the perpetrator. They mainly wanted to give an answer to their parents, who were over 80 years old and were waiting every day for the news of the capture of their daughter's murderer, they said with sorrow that their mother Mazal hoped the monster would be caught while she was still alive, but she was getting weaker and was crying out for a response from the police. They highlighted that the worst part was not knowing where they stood because no one spoke to them honestly. In 2019, another significant event occurred. With court approval, the police exhumed Nava's remains for additional testing. Investigators then reported that they had compiled a profile of the killer, implying that he was still alive, around 70 years old and was about 30 at the time of the crime. They added that he was someone with a criminal record living in central Israel. A total of 100 detectives were assigned to the case after its reopening due to advancements in DNA identification technology. The investigation was highly confidential. On August 29th, Amos Shelev, once a person of interest in the case, appeared for questioning regarding the crime. However, the reason wasn't clear as he wasn't considered a suspect. Upon entering the station, 
he declared that his summoning was complete nonsense. His lawyer conveyed the impression that the police were clueless and were merely redoing an investigation that had yielded nothing in the past. He added that the exhumation of the body seemed unwarranted and the police were trying to cover their mistakes by all means possible. In the four weeks since Nava's body was exhumed, the autopsy was performed. However, it did not yield any information that could advance the investigation as the remains were in a very poor state. During this time in August 2019, the police gave Nava's parents the earrings she was wearing when she was killed, but did not inform them when or where they were found. One of the brothers said at that time that there was no new information apart from the earrings, which definitely gave them hope, because the police said that once the investigation concluded, they would provide the family with all the answers. Currently, the case remains open, and no new information has been revealed due to a gag order placed on the publication of any details. The police were brief in the information they provided, stating only that the exhumation of the body had taken place recently in coordination with Nava's family. They also mentioned that the investigation was being overseen by the District Attorney's Office of Tel Aviv. In 2019, Mazal, Nava's 90-year-old mother, told the Israeli media that the family agreed to do everything possible to uncover the truth and find out who committed this atrocity. She added that she would give her life and whatever it took to find the person who took her 11-year-old girl away. She also made an important point that she had no idea who her daughter's killer could be, but believed that the friend Nava went to visit, and her mother did know but didn't want to speak the truth. It's true that Tali and all her other friends were investigated, and although she was interrogated repeatedly, no evidence was found linking her to the events. An investigator who was part of the Bat Yam police at the time of the crime indicated that there was a large team of agents working exclusively with the family and friends to follow any lead, no matter how minimal, and they found nothing on Tali. Therefore, he didn't believe that she had anything to do with the murder. Nava's sister stated that they agreed to open her grave because the mystery of her murder lingered with them every day while their elderly and sick parents continued to fight undaunted, waiting for an answer and a resolution. One of Nava's brothers mentioned in an interview that the police had told the family that with the new technology available, progress could be made in the case. He affirmed that they were still clinging to hope because his sister was a kind-hearted little girl, and one awful day their world collapsed with her disappearance and death. Suspects, searches, investigation teams, special research teams, significance, conjecture, speculation, and zero results. The killer or killers have not been discovered to this day. And well, that concludes today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, give a like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. This is Unreal True Crime. See you soon.